Welcome to Set Free. How are you? How's everyone doing tonight? All right, wonderful. <laughs> My name is Heather. I'm going to go ahead and tell you uh, who is Set Free, right? Who is Set Free? Set Free is a healing and recovery ministry that exists to provide a space for individuals who are overwhelmed by any form of mental health challenge and or addiction in order to experience freedom in Christ and discover a new way of life. This is a safe place for you to grow in your faith and connect with others. We believe that healing and recovery both take place through your relationship with God and connecting with others in the context of shared experiences. Our promise to every person who seeks help here at Set Free is that he or she will receive hope, encouragement, love, and prayer. Personal growth, however, is a process and not a destination and will always be based upon one's willingness to do all that is suggested. We encourage sponsorship and the working of the 12 steps. If you would like more information regarding on how to obtain a sponsor and work the 12 steps, please ask your group leader or pastor, Jennifer Felix. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome up Dre. What is anxiety? Anxiety is your body's natural response to stress. It's a feeling of fear or apprehension about what's to come, such as the first day of school, going to a job interview, or giving a speech. Things such as these may cause most people to feel fear and nervous. But if your feelings of anxiety are heightened and or interfering in your life in any way, then Set Free is definitely a place for you. We are here for you, and we are here to provide you hope, encouragement, love, and prayer as well. You are not separate from, but a part of our ministry, family, and we welcome you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray us in, and I'll bring up Pastor Jen, and we'll dive into the message. So if you'll all bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We are just so thankful and so blessed that we can be a part of this, uh, this ministry, Father, that we can be here tonight, um, receive your word through Pastor Jen. Um, Father, you are working wonders in this group, and we just are so thankful that, that we are here and able to break chains that have bound us um, to past addictions, Father, but no more. Uh, I pray that uh, you come over this message tonight, that you allow Pastor Jen to deliver it the way you want it delivered, and for us to receive it the way you desire us to receive it. Father, I also pray for those that can't be here tonight. I pray that you uh, put healing over them, um, whether it be sickness or um, lost loved ones or whatever may be keeping people from being here tonight. Father, we know it's important, but you are with them, and uh, in you there is strength. And with the, with the armor of God, there is no Goliath too big, Father. And uh, uh, we just pray that you come over this ministry tonight. Um, you come over this group. Let us have an amazing um, uh, time together, Father. And uh, we lift it up to you in your heavenly name. Amen. And Pastor Jen. All right, so how's everybody doing this evening? You know, I always feel bad for the front row. Do you ever notice that nobody ever likes the front row? Unless you're at a concert, then everybody wants the front row. If you're at a concert, then everybody fights for the front row, right? Is that how it works? All right, all right, so everybody's excited to be here this evening? Right? Check this out, sweetie. All right, welcome to Set Free. Okay, for those of you who don't know, if you're here for the first time, we are filming because we have Set Free on Thursday nights as well, and we do Thursday nights online. And so what I like to do is welcome everybody who is watching with us online. So if you're watching online right now, I wanna welcome you because as with anyone, whether you are here on campus or watching online, watching on demand, however it is that you're grabbing a hold of this message, I wanna say welcome, you are valuable, you are important, you are loved, you are welcome here at Set Free. And so with that, we are going to dive into tonight's message, right? Now, I'm gonna ask you all a very serious question and I want you all to be extremely honest because we all know that we are amongst a group of people who have always been honest throughout their entire lives, right? <laughs> Come on, we've all been extremely honest, right? We've never said a lie our entire life, right? Wrong room. Right? <laughs> wrong, wrong room. <laughs> right? All right, so check this out. Who here has ever in their life smoked cigarettes? I know, I know, I know. Those of you may not know, but yes, I'm the pastor, but there was a time in my life in which I smoked those little nasty things called cigarettes. Now, I'm gonna date myself, and some of you guys can remember. Who here can appreciate the day when a pack of cigarettes only cost 85 cents? 
Come on. Come on. When smoking cigarettes wasn't, wasn't going to cost you an arm and a leg and like your firstborn child or something. I, I remember like a week or so ago, I was behind a, a person there at the store and they actually it was just at Walgreens and they bought a pack of cigarettes and I think it was like eight bucks. I was like, eight bucks? And then the lady behind the register, she's like, man, it's like 50, 60 bucks or something for a carton. I'm like, holy cow, I'm so grateful I don't smoke anymore, <laughs> right? But I thought, you know, for what it is we're going to talk about tonight, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my life and what life was like when I used to smoke cigarettes. You know, I got to be honest with you, when I used to smoke cigarettes, cigarettes were the most important thing in my life. I mean, they were so important. They were, they were seriously just right up there, man, with like doing drugs. Now, who here, like, come on, I know not all of you did drugs, but for, the, for those of you who did drugs, how many of you, it was the most important thing in your life? It was, the, it was what you thought about when you woke up. It was what you thought about the entire time throughout your day. I mean, it was all about doing drugs and finding ways and means to get drugs, do drugs, do more drugs. And oh my gosh, it was just kind of, you were either with me or you were against me. And if you were against me, get out of my way right? It was, oh my gosh. But think about cigarettes, okay? And for those of you, you're going to really appreciate what I'm going to share with you here. And I guarantee you, you are going to relate with what I share with you here. Because I know for me, when I began smoking cigarettes, number one, they tasted nasty. Not one single person can tell me that when you picked up a cigarette, I know for me, when I was 12 years old, when I picked up that cigarette and decided to take that first hit that I was able to take it in, breathe it all in, and that the room didn't spin, that I didn't choke myself out of my lungs, and that it tasted mighty fine, because that's not what happened. <laughs> hey, the room went spinning, my lungs were hacking, and, and, and let me tell you something, I couldn't get myself to a piece of gum or something quick enough, because I was like, but you know what, I was bound to determine to make that thing taste good and feel good. And I was gonna smoke it until it did. Right? Because we're bound and we're determined. And then when your friend said, how to feel? Good. <laughs> right? First, <laughs> you like it? Yeah, of course. Didn't you? <laughs> right? So you got to take your second hit. Right? But you want to know something? We smoked it until, we, until it tasted good. Yeah. We smoked it until it tasted good. Right? And when it started tasting good, then all of a sudden what happened was then it became the first thing I did when I woke up. It's the first thing I thought about when I woke up. Before I even crawled out of bed, it's the first thing that I had to have. Before I brushed my teeth, before I went to the bathroom, before my feet even hit the floor, it's the first thing that I grabbed. And I didn't even have to have a fresh cigarette. All I needed was a butt that was in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the what it was, what is it? The ashtray, right? And the ashtray. And, and you know what? I could make anything into an ashtray. Remember you take the Coke cans and you'd cut them and you'd make those into ashtrays? You, like anything you had around you, you'd make into an ashtray, right? And you, all you had to do was pour, all you had to do, you had to pour water in it. Just have a little bit of the Coke left in that, in that little can, and that was enough. You could just drop, the, remember? Or you cut little slivers, and then that would hold your little butt in there. <laughs> Man, we were creative back in the day. Come on, right? It was the first thing I did, and I know it was the first thing you did, right? Before we brushed our teeth, before we went to the bathroom, before we did anything, before I even opened my eyeballs, I'd have a cigarette in my mouth, right? Even this, before every meal and after every meal, I had to have a cigarette, all right? It had to be between my fingers. I had to have it, right? It was, I, ha I had to smoke when I drank. I had to have a cigarette when I did drugs. I had to have a cigarette when I didn't drink. I had to have a cigarette when I didn't do drugs. Now, tell me this. I had to have a cigarette before and after every single meal. Now, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't following Jesus. And I bet you there was a time you all weren't following Jesus either. Right? There was a time. I didn't wake up and come out of my mother's womb as a pastor. <laughs> That's not how life worked for me. And, uh, and as much as my parents introduced me to church, I wasn't a pastor the moment I walked into the church. And uh, trust me, I, I was even less righteous, <laughs> right? Which meant that obviously by the time I decided I wanted to drink, do drugs, and do all the things that went along with it, uh, A, wasn't a pastor, B, wasn't a Christian, and guaranteed wasn't following Jesus, <laughs> right? So when I was doing all these things, and I know some of you guys can relate, okay? See, because not only was I smoking when I first woke up in the morning, I was smoking. Who, who here could ever get in a car and drive and not have a cigarette in your hand? No. Come on. We had to, I'm, come on. Like, you got in the car, you just had to light up. The, you couldn't even start your car before lighting up a cigarette. 
right? And you always had to have another one ready to go. You didn't even have to, like, come on. Who needed a lighter to light the second cigarette? You don't need, if you had to have a lighter to light the cigarette, you really weren't a smoker. <laughs> you had to have the cigarette already going and you'd, already, you'd light that second cigarette, right? I, I remember those days, come on, come on right? And, uh, and if you really wanted to make it last, you'd save all the butts, even if you got only one hit out of that leftover butt, <laughs> right? But you want to know something, man? You would smoke before sex, during sex, and immediately after sex, because that's just what was required. Yeah. And the sex didn't even have to be good. The cigarette needed to be. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because the cigarette made everything better. <laughs> it just made everything better. Cigarettes were that important. They were that important, and it was something that was of the highest priority. Even when I got clean off drugs, cigarettes were the highest priority. And then guess what? Even the little label on the side of the pack of the cigarettes that said, Surgeon General's warning, this may cause cancer. I said, yeah, that's not going to happen to me. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like when they say, don't drink and drive. Oh, yeah, nothing's bad going to happen to me. You know? Don't do too many drugs. Well, actually, the thing was, don't do drugs. <laughs> In my head, it was just like, as long as I don't do too many, then bad things won't happen. <laughs> right? How many here could attest to the fact that when you do drugs, bad things happen? <laughs> Come on. You're like, every time my thinking thought bad things wouldn't happen, bad things happened. <laughs> right? And every time I thought that I had a good decision or a good thought, it was typically a very bad thought. <laughs> right? But cigarettes were the, were the highest priority even when I got clean. And I truly thank God that it has now been something like 25 plus years that I haven't had a cigarette. Hallelujah. Right? Now that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. But the reality is we all, you and me, have things in our life that at various times in our life that we have to make a decision to give up. We have to make a decision. Why? Because it has taken the place a more important place in our life and in our heart than God has, and it has become a priority, yeah. right? It's become a priority. And I know for me, almost 27 years ago, that was alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs took a priority inside of my life. God willing, this March, I'll have 27 years clean. I have over 25 years off cigarettes, right? But the question now is, although I hang my hat on that, that's not the only thing. It's like I haven't come to the place of arrival because see, the question now is, what do I need to give up today? What do I have to give up in the here and the now that's taking priority in my life that is inhibiting me and my growth and my relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ? And if I say nothing, I am a fool. I am a fool. What is it in my life that's standing and preventing me and at very least hindering me from having, receiving, and experiencing the fullness of all that it is that God desires for me to have, receive, and experience inside of me and inside of my life and inside of my relationship with Christ? And the question and the reality of that is the same is true for you, right? What is it that you need to give up? And I can't tell you what it is that you need to give up because I don't know what you need to give up. I know what I need to give up. I need to get out of my own way. See, I got this thing called obsessive compulsive thinking. Now, to be honest with you, I got things even right now that are driving me crazy. They're driving me so crazy I can't even think straight, right? I got a stupid car key that right now, it doesn't even do what it's supposed to do. And this is no lie. It's a key that's supposed to, when I hit a button, open the car door and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I got two keys that do that. It they don't work. I got to take the stupid key, put it inside the key thing, and actually turn it. And do what we used to have to do like 40 years ago. <laughs> and you tell me that's not driving me crazy when the stupid car's a BMW. Like that's driving me absolutely out of my mind. You know, and, and that kind of stuff keeps me up at night. <laughs> it's driving me out of mind. Now tell me that, that you want to know what else is driving, keeping me up at night. And this is no lie. I just had dinner with somebody tonight, keeping me up at night. And I share this stuff with you because this is real stuff happening inside of my life. Christmas, remember it rained. Rained like no tomorrow, right? Everybody's so happy when their house doesn't get flooded, right? We're so happy that it rains and our house doesn't get flooded. I got a spa that my husband and I bought like 11 years ago that I thought was a blessing that is right now is a, nothing but a curse inside of my life, <laughs> right? 
And why is it a curse? Because the, the, the cover on it broke. And when it broke, it got waterlogged. And then when it got waterlogged, I had to figure out how to lift the stupid thing. But the problem is my husband's dead, so I had to figure out how to lift it on my own. And that sucked. And then I figured out how to lift it, and I thought I was he-woman. <laughs> right? <laughs> And I got that thing lifted, and then I couldn't get the other part of it lifted. And I thought I'd go to my next door neighbor to help, only they had COVID. So I couldn't get them to help me. So then I thought I was super he woman. And then when I got the rest of it lifted, it overlifted, and the water and the rest of it overlifted it, and it broke the brackets. And then the thing flung in back of the spa and went right behind the spa. And, and the one person who knows what that looks like is Robert knows what that looks like, and that sucked for me. <laughs> Tell me that wouldn't suck for me. <laughs> that sucked for me. <laughs> that way sucked for me. <laughs> so then I had to figure out how am I going to get that stupid, that stupid cover from, from a little tiny little spot between the spa and my back wall. Didn't tell me that didn't keep me up at night. Figured out how to do that, right? Then I got all the water out and I thought I got it all fixed. Haven't got it all fixed because for the last week, my spa has been leaking water. And every single day, I've had to put water inside my spa as it's leaking water. And I'm trying to get a repair guy out to come to look at it. Only they all got COVID. <laughs> right? <laughs> they all got COVID. <laughs> and I finally got somebody that I talked to yesterday. And he goes, you know, it could cost you about $3,000. And I go, you know, I didn't ask you how much it was going to cost. I asked you if you'd come and look at it. So could you please just shut up and come to my house? <laughs> and if it's $3,000, I'll pay you the 150 for coming and tell you to leave. <laughs> and I'll figure something else out and I'll pray to God. Because if he can cure cancer, he can stop a leak. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? But the reality of it is, man, we all are going to have problems in this life. Right? The question is, these problems don't have to take us down. They don't have to take us out. And they don't have to ruin our day but but see I got this thing called obsessive compulsive thinking that can and, and trust me when I tell you this obsessive compulsive thinking will hijack my relationship with the Lord and it'll hijack my time spent with the Lord and I'll lay in my bed at night and if you were to call me when my head is on these thoughts it's a pointless phone call because <laughs> I'm like I can't talk right now why because I'm obsessing on what doesn't matter <laughs> because I don't want to talk to you right now, because <laughs> I'm obsessing, <laughs> you know? And these are like serious issues. I got something coming over between 8 and 12, so please don't call me between 8 and 12 tomorrow, because I'm not going to pick up my phone unless you're the repair guy. <laughs> and Robert's laughing because he knows. He's, he's seen me when I was on the phone with the electric company. <laughs> and when he tried to talk to me, I looked at him and said, don't talk to me right now. <laughs> yeah. But there's something like I know, you know, and there's things in your life that you're like, what do you struggle with? See, because when we give up the things called drugs and alcohol, we still got these other things that we struggle with inside of our life that we got to figure out. And we can't figure these things out by ourselves on our own apart from the Lord, right? We need the help of the Lord. We need the help of one another. And the problem that we have is called ourselves. Our one single most biggest problem that we have is called ourselves. We get in the way of ourselves. And what happens is, is we think that we got the solution when we're the ones that created the problem. <laughs> if we created the problem, I can pretty much guarantee you we can't, we can't uh, come up with the solution. We need the help of others. Problem is, we got this thing called pride that says, no, I don't need your help. I got it figured out. <laughs> right? And, uh, and it's hard because when we say that we need help, that's one thing. But then when we say, I need help and I'm willing to do it your way, that's a totally different thing. Because, see, I can tell you I need help, but to tell you then I w that I'm willing to do it your way means that I'm going to have to be vulnerable enough to say that um, I don't got it all figured out. And that's a little bit of, of a thing called vulnerability. And vulnerability is difficult. It's hard. And guess what? Vulnerability and allowing ourselves to, to get out of the way is a daily process that requires a daily commitment. See, we can't do it one day and think that we've done it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I've met people that say, oh yeah, I go to set free. And I'm like, well, I haven't seen you in six months. You don't really go to set free, <laughs> right? Or, well, I'm a part of Crossroads. When's the last time you came? 
<laughs> you know, I'm seriously, no, no kidding. I've had people call and be like, I'm a member of Crossroads. When's the last time you came when Barry was pastor? Yeah, well, that was over 13 years ago. So I guess you're really not a member of Crossroads, are you? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, people like we tell on ourselves, we really, when we think we're fooling people, we're really not, right? But, but there's always going to be something. But what is that something in your life that's hindering your spiritual growth and the transformational life that God desires for you to have and the one that you have convinced yourself that you'd like to have without actually having to put the work in, let alone actually have to change anything inside of you? See, because you see, we all want the change, but the reality is, is do you really, are you really willing to do the work? Yeah, or is it that you just don't want the consequences or the effects that what's happening in your life, but you really don't want to have to put in the change? Like, I still want to drink, I just don't want to get any more DUIs. <laughs> yeah, I still want to do drugs, I just don't want to keep going to jail. Or I just don't want my wife or my husband to be on my case anymore, but I still really want to keep getting high. Right? What, what, are, we willing to, what are we willing to do to change? And uh, sometimes the willingness, and oftentimes more likely than not, it's hard. And more times than not, you're gonna wanna quit. But you keep going anyways. And why do you keep going anyways? Because that requires a power that's greater than yourself. And what power is that? That power that's inside of you that says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And that power is Jesus Christ. And that power, the enemy cannot overcome, conquer, compromise, get in the way of. Because why? Because Jesus went to the cross, conquered death, and nothing can stop him. He said, not even the gates of hell can take him down. And if not even the gates of hell can take him down, guess what? Your struggle can't stop him either. When we stop resisting the power that is within us and allow that power to work within us, great things can happen within us and transformation will happen within us as well. But guess what? This is what happens too. Is see, when we get out of the way, we expect that transformation to happen in like uh, 60 seconds. <laughs> and God's like, yeah, no. Like I can do it in 60 seconds, but yeah, I'm not gonna do it. Like your decision to follow me and salvation, yeah, that can happen. Actually, that can happen in five seconds. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Boom, done. You've made the decision. Great. See, but following me and the transformational life, see, like I'm 52 years old. So when Jesus says, you know, Jennifer, it took you 52 years to kind of jack things up right now, you know, and you want me to fix things overnight? How about this? How about you spend the rest of your life following me and I'll take as long as I want until the time it is for you to leave earth for me to transform your life. But you just keep trusting me, following me, pressing into me and I will do it in my timing and you let me worry about that timing. And see, and it's not my responsibility to give you what it is that you want in your timing the way you want it. Right? He's like, but just trust me. See, and that's called the blind faith. Just trust me, follow me. But we want to know what, when, how, why. We want to know all these things. He, you know, the question is, is I think Jesus turns around and he, what the one question he wants to ask us oftentimes is do you trust that the end result will be worth it? Do you trust that the process I'm going to take you through will be worth it in the end? Or do you want to keep doing things your way and then complaining about the results that you keep on getting? Do you want to keep doing things your way, right? See, because the reality is nothing changes if nothing changes. And something has to change inside you in order for something to change about you. Something has to change. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 29, there's a story about a rich young ruler. And in this story, the rich young ruler goes to Jesus and asks Jesus a very interesting question. And in the scripture, this is what it says. It says, it says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think that many of you guys come in here and you say, what must I do to have a better life? <laughs> what must I do to stop doing drugs? What must I do to not have anxiety? What must I do to have a better day and not have a depression? What must I do to stop drinking? What must I do for all the crap, all the stuff that's happened in my life to change? What must I do? And the moment we tell you, I think you leave sad because you don't really want to do it, <laughs> right? What you want is the easy pill. <laughs> 
What you want is the easy solution. And when we tell you, we tell you, get a sponsor, work steps, keep coming back every single week. In fact, we tell you all these things, and I'm going to get to those in just a little bit. But then when we tell you, you're going to do what this guy did, right? See, and at first glance, one might think that this man was incredibly intentional with what he wanted. And we think that, that you're incredibly intentional. Why? Because you walked in, you came. Praise God, you came. That is a good thing. And it's a good thing the guy ran up to Jesus, right? He was intentional. Why? Because he ran up to Jesus. He didn't just nonchalantly. Oh, I just walked. No, he wasn't just moseying along down the road. No, he ran up to Jesus. That's pretty incredible. Not only that, one might also think that he was incredibly humble. Not only did he run up to Jesus, but then he knelt. Right when he got to him, he knelt before Jesus, right? So some people might hear, man, they might walk an entire mile to get here, right? They might hitch a ride to get here. One might think that's incredible. That's awesome. Some people might just sit in the front row. I mean, Okay, we got one guy in the front row. <laughs> Praise Jesus. We got one guy in the front row. <laughs> Wait, what's your name? Jose. Nice to meet you, Jose. We got a front row guy. Everybody say hi, Jose. Hi, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, they are and then this guy says, good teacher, right? But do you realize in that day and age, we might think that this guy's giving Jesus a compliment, but he's not really giving him a compliment because this guy would have already known who Jesus was. He would have known that Jesus himself was God himself, right? So it wasn't exactly like a compliment, right? And on the surface, but all this looks good when we read the scripture. And for so many who come here to set free and, or some other kind of a ministry or a program such as this, in the beginning, everything looks so good on the surface, but in reality, that beneath the surface, it's not. And why is that? Because the answer they receive to the question is not the one they actually want to hear. And you see, so many times, you know, so many, they want to do things on their terms and not on God's terms. You know, when you want to do things your way rather than God's way. But that's not how it works when it comes to prioritizing. And the one thing we're talking about, the simplicity of things and, and the power of one. And tonight is the power of the one thing. What are we to prioritize? The one thing to prioritize, right? And when it comes to prioritizing, God is pretty serious about who is to come first, right? And this guy is saying, what is the one thing I must do to inherit eternal life? He's asking about the one thing, the one thing to do. And in this story, Jesus saw beneath the surface and saw the heart of the man. And you realize that see, Jesus sees beyond and beneath the surface, and he sees the heart of you and me. And no matter what we say, what we do, how cunning we can be, how manipulative we can be to one another, we can't be that way with Jesus. He will always see the heart of each and every one of us. And in verses 18 through 22, the reality of the truth begins to rise to the surface. And this is what the scripture says. It says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Don't you love it? A question with a question. <laughs> He said, what must I do to eternal, you know, inherit eternal life? And, he, you know, and he's calling him a good teacher. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. See, this man should have known that Jesus himself was the Messiah and Jesus is God manifested in human form. He says, but to answer your question, now he's going to give him the answer. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all these commands since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. You know why I think so? Because he knew that that man was deceived. He was deceived. That man thought more of himself than he truly already was, right? He, pride had already set in. But Jesus felt genuine love for him. And then he said, there is still one thing. We're back at that one thing. There is still one thing you have not done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The one thing that he was called to give up, he didn't give up. Right? He didn't give up. He ran. He knelt. And he said, what must I do? And it looked like he had great intentions, as if he was willing to do whatever it took. But he wasn't willing to do whatever it took. In fact, he thought he had already done it all. 
But he still was asking, what's the one thing he must do? And Jesus told him the one thing, and that one thing was the one thing he was unwilling to do. It was about him not willing to give those things up. What's the one thing that you're not willing to give up? See, because that's the love of it, right? And it's interesting how many cliches that I've heard over the years and how many people have, how many people that have either resisted them or pressed into them, right? And see, whether or not we're willing, are we willing? That's the measurement of the success of whether or not we actually experience a transformed life. Are we willing to press in to what's necessary in order to change? Or do we resist and we walk away sad because we're actually not willing to do those things? Jesus didn't tell him to sell everything because Jesus thought that the, that, that the possessions were bad. It's because they stood in the way of the relationship that Jesus desired for that man to have with him. And the man loved those possessions more than the man could ever love Jesus. What is it that we love more than we could ever love Jesus? See, and we're only as strong as our weakest link, right? And the ones who have resisted the little cliches that we have in ministries such as this are the ones who are like the rich young ruler who walk away sad. And these cliches, let me give you one of these, right? One of them is 90 meetings in 90 days. <laughs> I got to tell you, now that sounds like, what? Oh my God, that's huge. Let me tell you something, man. I got high 24 hours a day, seven days a week for way more than 90, day, 90 days in a row, <laughs> Right? Way more. Now, let me give you some of the excuses. I can't do that. That's too much to ask. There's no way. I got to work every single day. I got a family to support. I got kids. I got all these other things. I, I, I'm a busy person, 90 meetings. That's ridiculous. You know, what's ridiculous is not doing it. What's ridiculous is I did drugs every single day. What's ridiculous is that I'm not willing to do whatever it takes, but yet I say I want to have a different life, a changed life, a transformed life. What's ridiculous is that I don't have the willingness. Go back out there and get all your, your misery refunded and then come back when you're really willing to do whatever it takes because right now you're not, right? And when I was really serious about getting clean and I came back, I did way more than 90 meetings in 90 days. Sometimes I did two, three, four, five meetings in a day. And if you told me to stand in a corner or stand on my head for five hours a day and that's how I was going to stay clean, I was willing to do it. And guess what? 90 meetings in 90 days became a blessing and not a burden. And guess what? I wound up staying clean. Amazing how that happens. We don't give these kind of cliches and these kind of suggestions because we want it to be a burden. We say it because guess what? What goes on between our head, between our ears, can be a nightmare. And my best thinking led me into some of my worst places. And we need, we need a place to go that's going to fill the time, that's going to help us to redevelop what goes on inside of our head, to help us restructure our thinking. Right? You ever hear of that stinking thinking, man? Right? And so 90 meetings in 90 days. Do I do 90 meetings in 90 days now? No, I don't do 90 meetings in 90 days. But if I was brand new, absolutely. The first thing I tell people, 90 meetings in 90 days. And if you could do more, do it. If you can do more, do it. Why? Number one, because if you got high every single day, why would you not want to do 90 meetings in 90 days? Why would you not? What else you got going on? When you stop using, what else you got going on? You shouldn't have those same friends. Because <laughs> those same friends, trust me, they're probably not getting clean. Right? Next cliche. Get a sponsor work steps. <laughs> well, I don't need one of those. I can do it on my own. <laughs> really? How's that been working for you all these years? <laughs> you know? Well, I'll just work the steps on my own. Really? <laughs> Everything I ever did on my own always landed me in places I should have never gone. <laughs> right? And, uh, and my best thinking landed me in the worst places. And once I discovered that my head was out to get me and having a sponsor working steps didn't, to be, didn't, didn't seem to be such a bad idea, it, it, it actually brought about spiritual growth. It actually brought about um, an awareness within inside of myself that I would not have been able to have had I not have had somebody else's brain and somebody else's insight and somebody else's spiritual awareness and insight to help me along the way. And guess what? That became a person that I could call on, 
lean on, share with in some of the times that were the most difficult? Because I guarantee you, just because in the beginning days, just because I was having a good day today didn't mean tomorrow wasn't going to be a bad day. And I needed a support network of people around me that were going to help me through the bad days. Right? And, and thinking that I could do it on my own and by myself and alone was ridiculous. I couldn't. I needed the help of other people. And actually having a sponsor on Working Steps became a blessing and not a burden. And it became such a benefit to anything. And it became a relief. And that's why we recommend those things here. And that became a priority. Right? And then there's another cliche. Those who keep going to meetings regularly stay clean. Right? <laughs> I remember, you know, the people say, I don't need all those meetings. I can do it my way. My way on anything never worked. I needed to do it God's way. God's way. It's, it's not about my will. It's about God's will. Right? And, and I needed to get out of my way. I needed to get out of my way long enough to allow God's way to sink in deep enough inside of me to where actually he could transform me. Because I couldn't transform myself. And I don't believe that you guys can transform yourself either. It is only through the power and the grace and the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. That from inside of yourself, from deep inside of yourself, can you experience a transformed life. You can have a better life apart from Jesus. Yeah, stop doing drugs, you'll have a better life. But you cannot have a spiritually deep, transformed life inside of yourself apart from Jesus Christ. Scripture says, apart from me, you can't do anything, but through me, all things are possible. Through me, all things are possible, right? In this world, we're going to have many trials and struggles, but take heart because he has overcome the world. Praise Jesus, right? Praise Jesus, right? And guess what? Relapse isn't a requirement, but guess what? It is a reality. Many people do, but you don't have to. It is a part of my story, but it doesn't have to be a part of everybody's story. Right? And you can do the things that, you don't, that, that, that we all suggest. And we don't suggest them because we want to be a thorn in your side. We don't suggest them so we can make things more difficult. We actually suggest them so that it can actually be better for you. They're suggested so they, your life can be better, so there can be a blessing and not a burden. So the transformation in your life can lead you to a place of happiness, joy, hope, and freedom continuously. Will you arrive at a perfect place of all that? Not until the other side. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. But guess what? The more you keep doing it, you're going to realize that you're experiencing a progression of it, a continuous. And the only time that it'll stop is if you stop. Because God won't stop as long as you don't stop. You know, Scripture says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. But God, God's not the one who stops. We do. We do. As long as we keep drawing closer to him, he'll, he'll keep drawing closer to us. That's just how it works. And all these cliches are not spoken and shared with the goal of us being annoying. <laughs> right? The goal is not for us to be annoying. They're spoken about with the goal of them being applied so that you may obtain and experience something new, something different, and something so incredible that it changes and transforms your life. Right? With Jesus Christ at the center. And then, you will then know what the one thing is to prioritize in your life, which comes directly from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And this is what it says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And when you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, nothing will come before the Lord. And the scripture tells us that the Lord is a jealous God. Do not put anything before him. Anything that comes before him is actually an idol, and he's not happy about it. He's not happy about it. When you go back to the nation of Israel and you read the scriptures and Moses went up on, the, on Mount Sinai to get, to get the Ten Commandments and get it, the law from God, it didn't take long before they built the, the, the golden calf and they began saying that that's the one that took them out of Egypt. I would have been ticked off. God was pretty mad. God was like, Moses, you got to get down the mountain. Them people are doing something pretty messed up right now. Right? <laughs> And Moses, the moment he got down that mountain and saw what they did, Moses was so mad, he took the, the tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on, and he smashed them. 
Holy cow, he smashed them. Guess what he had to do then? He had to walk back up that mountain. I would have been so mad at those people. I would have, I would have given, given them a big old smackdown. Because then he had to go up that mountain. And you know what can God say? I kid you not in the scriptures, this is what it says. God says, take the tablets and now write on, I got to write on them, you know, the ones you broke. God was not happy. We got to do this again. And the people are like, really? Can you imagine if I put this phone together? I'm like, this is the phone that brought me out of Egypt. Really? But you want to know something, man? How, what, what things do we actually place before God? I got I to gotta tell you, how many of us, when we don't have our phone, it brings us anxiety? Yes. <laughs> what, I, I'm going to tell you, no lie right here, no lie. I get anxiety with the stupid red bar. <laughs> Who gets anxiety with the red bar? I get anxiety with the red bar. That red, that red bar stresses me out. And then somebody get me a charger, fast. Don't even talk to me. Just get me a charger. <laughs> Just get me a charger, fast. <laughs> right? But man, we got to love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, our soul, our strength. And we got to put nothing before the Lord. And when the Lord asks us, when we are going through a fast, if you were going to do a fast, a 40-day fast, every year we do a fast, right? What's the one thing you'd give up? In fact, let me ask you this. What's the one thing you wouldn't give up? Because the one thing you wouldn't give up is the one thing that you should give up. Amen. Right? The one thing you wouldn't give up is the one thing you should give up. Why? Because fasting is about sacrifice. And you don't do it with the idea of it being horrible. You do it with the idea of it being a sacrifice because you look at the cross and tell me that wasn't a sacrifice. Oh, come on. Tell me that wasn't a sacrifice. Right? And you do it. Why? Because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you're going to give him that as a sacrifice. Because he gave you his son as a sacrifice. Why? Because he loved you with all of his heart, all of his soul, and all of his strength. So much so that he gave you his son. Why? So that you could have eternal life, even though you didn't deserve it. And even on our best day, we still don't deserve it. On our best day, we still don't deserve it. And so many things we think we deserve, in all reality, we don't deserve anything. But by his grace, we have received everything. And yet we still want more, as if we, as if we deserve more. But our, our Lord has given us already everything, right? So at the end of the day, I got a, I got a jacuzzi that, you know, if it, if it can't be fixed, so what? So what? Is, is my life over because a jacuzzi can't get fixed? In the grand scheme of things, No. <laughs> Is my life over because a stupid key that I hit a remote for doesn't open? And now at least I can stick it in the thing and turn the key and it'll open. Remember, 40 years ago, I mean, come on, think about it. Even a, even a stupid TV set, man, we used to have to get up from the couch and actually turn the TV set, right? Come on, come on. Who, right? Who remembers the rabbit ears? I mean, come on, you know? I mean, who even remembers pre-microwave oven days? I mean, come on, right? We get... We, we forget the times. We get into all these luxuries as if we deserve all these things. And, and at the end of the day, it's just kind of like, really? Is life over if we don't have these things? No. I mean, no. Life is over if we don't have Jesus. That's when life is over. Any day with Jesus is a good day. Any day without Jesus is a day not worth living. But any day with Jesus is a glorious day and is a day worth rejoicing. And so when you're looking at what's the one thing to prioritize is putting him first in all things, in all circumstances, in all struggles, and giving him everything, everything, and not walking away sad like that rich young ruler did, right? Because Jesus isn't to be second. He's to be first where nothing comes before him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you, Father God, for the strict scriptures that you give us. I thank you, Father God, that you give us joy, you give us laughter, you give us hope. And I thank you, Father God, that you even allow us to go through challenges, trials, and struggles, Father God, because it reminds us each and every day of your presence. It reminds us, Father God, of your power. It reminds us every day, Father God, that you are the one who conquered the enemy. 
that follow God. It is not by our power and our might that we conquer the enemy, but we have a Savior who has already defeated the enemy. And there is nothing he can do to take us down or take us out, Father God, because we have a Savior in you who is standing before us, behind us, on all sides, Father God, protecting us. So I lift up your holy name. Thank you, Father God, for who you are. Thank you for the love that it is that you pour down upon each and every one of us. And may each and every person here determine what that one is in their life that they need to give up so that the one thing to prioritize in their life, to make first in their life, above anything else, is you. But I thank you and I praise you, Father, in your name. Amen. Amen.